Welcome to episode nine of the Hoop Thread Podcast. I'm here with Mark Bielkowski, Director of Basketball Operations at the University of Maryland. How are you doing, Mark? Oh, I'm really good. Thanks for having me. Excited. Glad to have you on. So um, my, my first question is just kind of, you know, how did you get to the spot you're in now? Uh, let's take it back on. Uh, yeah, you know, um, I'll take it back a little further than normal. Um, for me, at least, you know, I was in high school. I'm a junior in high school. And I, I've always wanted, you know, for me at least, be a part of basketball in some capacity. And, and for me, you know, I loved and enjoyed playing it. And I'll be honest with you, I read an article about John Chaney's matchup zone defense in geometry class my junior year. And I'll be honest with you, I wasn't doing geometry class. I was trying to make my own matchup zone defense. Mm-hmm. And I think at that moment, I knew, you know, for me long term, that I wanted to get, you know, on the coaching side of things. I felt a really strong love for the idea of X and O's and the idea of strategy and being competitive. Um, in your profession. And so from that moment, you know, it was how do I get into coaching? How do I become a college basketball coach? And I, I didn't really know, to be honest with you. Um, for me, you know, I, I knew how to get my foot in the door at a college program and my, my basketball skills, you know, would only open so many doors, so to speak. Um, and so, you know, I got an opportunity to kind of get my foot in the door at Georgia Southern as a manager for Coach Price. Uh, which was an unbelievable opportunity for me because at the level of Georgia Southern at the time, you know, we were probably deemed as that low major. And so I say that to say we didn't have a video guy. We didn't have an ops guy. You know, we had a third assistant who had a lot of different hats. And we didn't even have a graduate assistant. And so early on in my coaching journey, I was able to wear so many different hats as a manager. It wasn't just rebounding and equipment and you know, being on the court and doing different things. It was, hey, you need to do this expense report for me because I got to go recruiting tonight as a third assistant. Hey, let's go ahead and let's make sure at the time with VHSs that we're getting all the film exchanged out the right way. I'm going to put you in charge of that. And so that really kind of expanded my role and my responsibilities very quickly. Um, And so when I had the opportunity to interview for a graduate assistant position at UNC Charlotte, Coach Perrin, the operations guy at the time, who was probably one of my favorite people in the world, he said, you got to be able to do X, Y, and Z for me. And I was able to say to him, I can do all of those um, and more because of, you know, at a small major school, I got a chance to kind of put on different hats. And that's really kind of gave me the opportunity to get in the foot from Georgia Southern to Charlotte. And that Charlotte, I just, you know, every day to me was a job interview. And so whatever I could do to help the coaches, um, help the head coach, help us win as a program. It's kind of what I did, um, and I was just really fortunate enough to kind of move up from there. And then, um, you know, from Charlotte, spent a year with Coach Lutz, uh, which was, you know, won 19 games at that level, which really, really good. You know, we started 18-5. and five, and We beat Louisville on the road at the time. I think it was Rick Pitino's uh, largest defeat in the Yum Center at the time. And so we did some really successful things. Um, but, you know, the AD part of ways after one year with Coach Lutz. Coach Major came in, um, and he retained our operations guy. Um, and so, in a way, he kind of retained me and worked my way up from graduate assistant to video to ops and had a chance to be on the road for a year um, with Charlotte before taking the Maryland job. Cool. Uh, real quick on the Charlotte part, uh, I've read that you set up a military appreciation game. Can you kind of talk about, you know, what, what spawned that idea and, and what went into that process? Yeah, you know, that was, that was really neat. You know, at the time, we were educating our players um, on the national anthem a little bit. At the time, we did a boot camp with our team. And so we had one of the Army Rangers from the ROTC group come in and do one of those boot camps, 6, 6 a.m. workouts with our guys. It was a ton of success. Uh, all the coaches were involved in it. Um, And then our game that year, which happened to be Georgia Southern, was on, um, you know, Memorial, November 12th was on, you know, um, a day that had some impact for us. And so what I tried to do is how do we raise funds, um, you know, and and how can we be more than just us? And so what we did was was we got a design for a T-shirt. We went ahead and sold those T-shirts on campus. Uh, We really had the student body go out and and wear those T-shirts. We wore them. You know, as warm-ups and all those funds went to the Wounded Warrior Project. Um, and I think we raised, I want to say, we, you know, 
couple hundred to you know this over a thousand dollars with you know actual donating costs or so it was a way for for us as a program to use our platform and, and help somebody else and you know it was really neat during the game you know all military personnel ray uh stand it up and you know we got a chance to to applaud them in their efforts and so it was a really good collective collaboration with the entire athletic department awesome awesome so real quick, I wanted to, to come into family life real quick for a second. So you have a son and a daughter. Um, how has your life and, and your career changed since they were born? It's been awesome. It's been unbelievably fun. You know, you kind of get in this thing young and, and you're like, you know, I'm going to do anything I can do to, to get in the road and recruit or do this or, you know, do this and do that. And, and what it's allowed me to do is have such a better perspective with our players. And for me and for Coach, so Coach Turgeon is an unbelievable family man oriented for guy. People don't know who Coach Turgeon. And so he really wants our family and our kids around our program because I, I think it really humanizes us as, as coaches. Um, you know, for my kids, you know, they look up to our players as idols. Um, and they mean the world to them. And, and so seeing them interact, you know, really allows us to kind of put some of the barriers down a little bit from a coaching perspective. But I think in terms of a, you know, from a young coach to, to now I have kids and, and I have a wife, I think the biggest perspective that changes is, you know, from somebody who wants to jump from job to job and hopes in the rat race they get where they want to go. Well, you've got so many more variables now that you've got to start weighing in before you do go after a job or you don't go after a job. And so um, from a professional perspective, um, so much more weight. Uh, on what you do and don't do um, because of it affects more than just you now. Um, and having those discussions with your wife, um, I think are very, very important. Um, and then, you know, the challenging part, obviously, and those are in this profession, obviously know this is just the time away from family. Um, you're spending so much time away from the family. And so you have to have a very strong support system at home to allow you to do what your dream, right. To allow you to do what you want to do because, they have to sacrifice as well. Absolutely. Uh, talk about what led to your transition from, from Charlotte to Maryland, like how that happened. The connections. Yeah, so year five with Coach Major, um, you know, we, we ended up getting let go. Um, and so, you know, it became my job to find another job um, and, and kind of go back to the family life. We just bought a house, uh, my yeah. wife and I. We had, had a little one. She looked at me one day and was like, do I even hang up our pictures? I said, probably not, sweetie, um, probably not. And so it became my job to find a job. So I, I started to be in every single AU event. Um, I was going to all my coaching friends and, and going into their gyms. And, you know, I, I did a part-time job with Phenom Hoop Report, um, just evaluating talents and, and being around players and being around kids. And, and for me at the time, it didn't matter what level they were. I mean, if the kid could play basketball, and be a walk-on at Division Three level, I wanted to know who he was because, heck, I'll take a D3 job if I don't have a job. You know, it doesn't matter to me because coaching is coaching. Um, and so I was really trying to get a huge database of kids and evaluating as many kids as I could. Um, and then, you know, I'm at an event, a CP3 event, and I get a call um, that, you know, the video job's going to open at Maryland. Um, you know, my name was lucky enough to be one of the few names early on to be whispered um, as potential candidates. And so – um, you know, in this profession, I, I can know a lot of people, but if they don't really know me, it's not going to be beneficial. And so the right people at the right time said my name um, and allowed me to at least to be one of the final finalists early on in that position that, you know, allowed me to land at Maryland. Absolutely. That's awesome. Um, talk about some of the responsibilities you, you did as a video guy, you know, outside of, you know, your video role. Um, I think it's really important to share with people. Uh, if you want to move up the ladder, you got to really demonstrate that not only can you do your job, you can do other stuff and you can take on more stuff and take stuff off of the head coach's plate. So talk about that. Yeah. So I'll kind of, I'll start with video uh, first and, and, you know, technology is, is ever changing. And so um, it's always, it, it's, it's always, for the most part, making things easier for the head coach. And so for me early on, um, I, I had to figure out what Coach Turgeon's, um, you know, what, what, what could he, couldn't he do from a video 
perspective, not from a watching film, but how, how do I get the clips I want and how do I organize them and, and how do I educate our players to communicate the highest level? And so early on for me uh, was getting that understanding. I think the one thing that I tried to do early on was build a really big database for our coaches from a video perspective. And, and talking about that, you know, if we're going to play a team like Purdue, you know, not only are we going to break down everything they do in the last five and seven games, but, you know, let's go back and let's make sure, you know, we've got everything buttoned up and tight that we know everything they're going to do late clock OB under. Let's make sure we know what they're going to do, you know, in certain situations. You know, I haven't seen anybody switch a ball screen from the one five. We're thinking about do it. Let's go ahead and research it before coach asks about it and make sure what's their counter going to be if that's what we're going to do so we can be ready for their counter, so to speak. Um, and then really from that perspective to grow a position like the video coordinator position, you've really got to be in tune to recruiting. And what are your assistant coaches doing from a recruiting perspective? Who are they recruiting? Uh, who are their top three to five guys? What can you do from a graphic perspective? What can you do from a video highlight film perspective? What can you do from a style of play video? Um, and, and, and watch the film on the recruits so you know how to interconnect that so the assistant can connect to the recruit on, you know, hopefully a deeper level. And so I think when the, the best thing I, I tried to do was outside of, you know, which I love to do was the X and O's perspective of it was on the recruiting side. What can I do from a graphic standpoint? Um, can I remind coaches, hey, I know you're recruiting so-and-so at so-and-so, but just reminder, they got a game tonight. So here's a graphic you can send him to say good luck. Hey, coach, I know you're recruiting a ton of kids, but the one kid we're recruiting, he had 22 points last night. Here's a graphic you can send to him so he knows you know. Um, and so those areas I was, you know, early on really trying to grow that position from a recruiting aspect because, as we know, in college basketball, we all say it, recruiting is the lifeblood of a program. And, and you know, if you're not doing it um, – you know, you're going to pay for it later on. And so that's the biggest part that I try to grow the video perspective was being attuned to who we're recruiting um, and how I can help um, in ways that I could take some things off of coaches' plates. Gotcha. Gotcha. And how did that change, you know, when you moved over to the ops shop? Like what type of stuff are you doing on the side? So, you know, anytime – and, and I, you know, I, same thing happened at Charlotte. I got some video to ops and, and very similar to Maryland. Anytime it, you get promoted within, sometimes you, you, you at times carry those same responsibilities that you were really good at. You still kind of become the point man for those things. And so um, even though I moved in the operations role, you know, I'm still very much in charge of or in tune of our recruiting, um, especially from a graphic perspective, um, from a style of play perspective. Um, so I, I still kind of taken a lot of those roles with me. I think the biggest thing for me now is ops that I've tried to really focus on is just play relations. Um, I, I'm around our guys way more than most assistant coaches because they have to go recruit, right? Um, and so they're gone. They'll miss a practice here and there. And I, I, I'm the one constant face from a, a coaching perspective that's not the boss. But, um, and, 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 you know, so I really, really try to focus on, you know, even now during the pandemic is, you know, can I call all of our guys and FaceTime them and who's where and who's doing what and, and what kind of information does the head coach need to know about his players and, and what stuff that, you know, doesn't need to get to his desk and, and, and keeping the head coach in tune with his players while, you know, he managed his CEO, you know, company because, you know, he's got a, unbelievably a lot of stuff on, on the head coach's plate and, and there's a lot on the assistant coach's plate. And, you know, my job – is to continue to take those things off of them so they can perform at a higher level. And so for me, moving to the ops role, the one thing that I really circled that I wanted to do a much better job of was the play relations perspective because – and now, now all of a sudden I'm talking about their financial perspective because I know when the bills are getting – you know, the checks are going to get deposited. I'm talking to the apartments because now I know what the lease says now. So there's different things that allow me to have more interaction with them um, but at the same time, when I call a student athlete, I don't want him knowing why I'm calling, right? <laughs> you know, it's, oh, man, coach calling because of the quiz coming up. Or coach calling because of this. I, I want to have that dialogue and enough times I'm calling him. He knows this might be coach just seeing what's up, 
you know, and, and now it's the time I am asking you about the quiz. And so I think that's really important um, that the guys are hearing from you, you know, not just when you need them or not just when, you know, they might be in the wrong. You're, you're calling them all the time just to check on them and see how things are going. Gotcha. Gotcha. Real quick before I forget. So with, um, with Coach Turgeon at the beginning, you know, just trying to figure out, you know, his rhythms and what he's looking for, you know, how much of that was you asking him directly? How much of it was you asking the other coaches who have been around him? Um, and how much of it was kind of you reaching out to mentors to ask them, you know, what they would do and you know, what he would be looking for in their opinion? Yeah, no, that's a really good question because the first time, you know, I, I met Coach Turgeon was on my interview. And so there wasn't a relationship prior to being hired, uh, which happens a lot sometimes. Um, and so for me, I really leaned on the staff that was present um, early on to, you know, what, what kind of makes him tick, what's he looking for, uh, what are things that, you know, he's done a certain way that I need to continue. And, when, you know, more importantly, what are some things that, this position hasn't done that as an assistant you would like to see it elevated um and so i really relied on the assistants early on um you know and, and and then you know with the head coach you're just trying to have as much communication and dialogue as you can um and so you can have that relationship over time and and now all of a sudden you know what he's going to ask before he asks it and you've got that information already acquired um and then at any time you know I, I, for me you know, I love this profession because so many of my closest friends are really, they don't, they might not even know it, but they're really my mentors. And so I, I call them all the time, rely on them and, and give situations. And, hey, I'm thinking about this. What do you think about? Or should I attack this situation or scenario a different way? Um, and then sometimes, you, you know, hey, can you still coach me on what I'm doing and, and, and what my goals are? And so I try to use all three of them. But early on, we'll coach at Maryland. You know, I really relied on those assistants, um, Coach Bino Ranson, uh, Coach Warren at the time, and, and Coach Dustin Clark and, and, and Nemo Midvar. Um, hey, what really, you know, that I need to do to separate myself from the last guy, but uh, what are some things internally that I need to be aware of to keep this thing, you know, humming at a high level? Gotcha. Let's switch to, like, the, the present day. So with – what has COVID changed about recruiting and what has COVID changed in, in your and the coaching staff's, you know, everyday contact with each other and then also with the team? Yeah. So I'll start, you know, from a recruiting perspective, you know, obviously everybody now we're, we're just trying to be as creative as possible because what we're trying to do is, is having a lot of these kids, especially, you know, in this 21 and 20 class possibly commit sight unseen. And that's hard to do sometimes um, because we have such a tremendous sell when kids get on campus here, um, just from a campus environment to an unbelievable uh, basketball atmosphere that we have. Um, and so what we're really trying to do is, is, is paint a really good picture, whether it be a video, whether it be, you know, um, graphics, whether, you know, be a FaceTime, um, paint a really strong picture of what Maryland basketball is about. And so, you know, for us, from a coaching perspective, we've, you know, obviously done a lot more Zooms. I'm sure most staffs have done. You know, we've collaborated with a lot more videos than we've done in the past. Um, you know, we, we've really tried to educate ourselves on what admissions are doing with student bodies at this time. Is there anything that they have that we can use? Um, you know, we've had open dialogue with our football program. Hey, what are you guys are doing? And then at the same time, calling other people in our profession um, just to make sure that, you know, we're not missing out on anything, um, that we are being creative, that we are disseminating the information that needs to be um, taught to these kids to educate them on who we are and what we're about. Um, you know, and then from a, a coaching perspective, you know, I, we all kind of feel this way. You know, when you're talking to a recruit, and, you know, there's those kids and, and even coaches that, you know, they could fool you and you could fool them on the phone. But all of a sudden, an official visit, you've had three or four meals and you spent, you know, 18 to 20 hours with them in a two-day span, you have a lot better idea of who they are. And so what we've really been trying to put a lot more emphasis on is really making sure we understand all the people around him, whether that be the guidance counselor, the English teacher, you know, the JV coach, you know, any other people we can get involved with, just have an understanding of what makes that recruit tick and does that recruit really fit the DNA that we want? Um, because, again, 
he can tell us everything we want to hear. His film could look really, really good on, on you know, on film. But it's, it's who he is that really matters a lot more to us um, at the end of the day. And so we put a lot more prep work um, behind the scenes because we're not getting that opportunity to sit down face to face in the kids' home, sit down face to face with the parents, sit down face to face with the coach, um, you know, break bread. And so we're trying to do things differently to still be able to paint a strong picture of what makes this recruit tick. And again, does his character, does what he about, does he fit what we want, you know, our recruits to be about? Um, and then lastly, from a from a our player perspective, you know, it's been really unique. Um, you know, I, we, I miss our guys. I mean, it's, it's, it's unbelievable how much we miss our players and how much, you know, we're around them. I mean, you're around your players more than you're around your family. And so, you know, I, I've really started, you know, instead of calling guys, I FaceTime them all the time now. Um, I'm always FaceTime and I want to see what they're doing. Are they in the car? Are they in the rooms? Um, Hey, what are they doing from a workout perspective? Hey, how, how's mom doing? Um, and, and really just, you know, trying to listen to our guys right now. Um, and so I think, you know, keeping that, you know, open communication from the um, fact that we're not around them, I think it's been really important. So, you know, we've done some things as a coaching staff to make sure that we're continually in contact with our players outside of just certain Zoom team meetings that we're doing. Um, and besides checking on their academics, you know, we're making sure we're still in their everyday life. And, and I think that's been really important. Got you. Just out of curiosity, what does, what goes into a recruiting video? So say, you know, say you're recruiting me and, and right now you're doing the Zoom um, with me. You know, what, what is in that video? Kind of what goes into that? If that's okay. Yeah. So, you know, anytime you're recruiting kids, you're really educating kids. You're, you're really trying to educate them on, on what you're about, right? And, and, and part of what you're about is, okay, let's look at us offensively. And, and let's, let's try to simplify offensively what we do um, and why we think he's a fit for our program. And so, you know, if, if, if you're a point guard, let's, let's break down certain point guards that we've had in the past under Coach Turgeon, um, offensive stuff that we've done that's been successful that we feel like if he came to Maryland, you know, we'd be running similar actions because, one, we know it works. Um, two, you know, hopefully we feel like through our evaluation it's going to fit what he does really, really well. Um, and then, you know, always back up whatever we do on film through statistics, right? Because every highlight video we get from, a, from an email to, to I'm sure that every time they watch a, an edit on, on a different team's style of play, they're going to make every shot. Um, so we always want to back up all of our video with really, really good analytic stuff and, and, and breaking down, you know, why we do what we do, right? You see it works, but here's, here's some analytical points of references on why we think it's important. Here's some things that are really important to us from an analytical perspective um, and, and, and give him some data to back up what we're saying on film. And so that's really what we try to do uh, when showing a, a style of play video, um, showing the kid fits our offense, um, throwing some terminology words to him, some terminology buzzwords that, you know, are, are specific to us. Um, and, and, and again, e even though you're educating, you're coaching them, right? And, and, and you want to coach these kids. So you don't even know, but through these videos, you, you're, you're coaching them as well. Hey, hey what, what do you see here? What's your read here? Um, and here? And what's the why in that read a little bit? And, okay. If they do this, well, here's our counter and things like that. Just again, educating them on, on who we are and what we're about and doing that, you know, through film and, and through analytics. Gotcha. So nowadays, you know, Tipton edits and, you know, a lot of these edit, you know, companies and uh, other people that put together, you know, these commitment videos. Um, it's, it's a big thing nowadays. I mean, shoot, even at my level, it's a big thing. I mean, you know, middle schoolers are starting to use that for, to, to show where they're going to high school in the fall even if that can be a fluid thing. Um, in those situations, you know, if, if, if you're recruiting me, how often does the recruit reach out to you before they drop it and say, hey, you made it into my final five, hey, you didn't? You know, I, I've always wondered what that's like. You know, I, th I think it's, it's, it's individualized to that recruit. Um, you know, anytime, you know, you're going to be in a final three or final five, you know, you usually almost always have a um, – 
an idea ahead of time. Um, and if you don't and you happen to be in the final or whatever, then, then, then maybe you're more of the fluff than you are anything else. Um, and so, you know, most of the time in, in, in recruiting, you, you, know, you usually have a good idea if you, if you have a chance. That's, that's kind of where we, we tend to use, you know, do we have a chance? And um, through your dialogue, through the recruiting process, you'll have a really strong feel with the relationship with everybody in his circle um, if you have that chance. Um, and, and if you don't, and, and so, you know, that, that's to answer that question, you know, it, it's, it's, you, you tend to know ahead of time. If you don't know, then you know, right. And that's kind of how I, I look at it a little bit. Do you think there would be any benefit to the NCAA kind of designating, you know, maybe one person or two people within that player's circle that they're contacting for recruiting to say, you know, you know, a recruit could identify my dad is the one to talk to. You know, obviously you're talking to me as well, but, you know, you don't have to talk to my AAU coach and my trainer and my mom and my dad and my uncle, you know, and my high school coach, just my dad. Do you think that would be helpful if they did streamline that process or would that be too difficult to kind of make sense? You know, I don't know. I don't know if I have, I have a great answer for that one. Um, you know, I think – you know, at first it sounds really, really good on paper, but all of a sudden I think if you're that parent or if you're that high school coach, that means everybody's calling you all the time. Um, and, and you're going to get over inundated because um, you're going to be on a phone call for 20 minutes this and you get a text message with that. And, and it's a lot. I mean, it, you know, especially when kids, quote, unquote, blow up and you've got 15 to 25 schools calling you, it, 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 it's a lot, um, and especially when they all want your time and you only have so much time to contribute. And so, um, I, you know, I understand the basis behind it because there are a lot of people who want in for the wrong reason. Um, and there's, you know, at the same time as a coach, you, you got to try to figure out, you know, who, who really is that person, right? Who really is going to be the one that's going to help this, you know, young man make this decision um, and, and make sure they're educated on who you are. And so uh, – I, it, to me, it makes sense from a coaching clinic perspective, but not <laughs> everything you hear in a coaching clinic, you go put the play in, doesn't always work, right? Um, and yeah. so that's that's kind of how I look at it a little bit. Um, and so, it, it, you know. Got you. Got you. So let's talk about, um, you know, recruiting and, you know, how important the DMV is, is to UMD. Um, there's kind of a perception that, that UMD is the state school that, um, maybe doesn't recruit that area as hard or, you know, they're just not able to keep all those kids home. Kind of talk about, you know, how that's, you know, fair or unfair. Yeah. Well, you know, for me at least, and again, being an operations guy, I can, I can only say so much, but, you know, being in, 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 you know, all those staff meetings, you know, Coach Surgeon took the job, you know, one of the main reasons he took the job is because of the DMV and because of the talent that's here. And because, and when I say talent, you know, for me, and this is going to be my sixth year here, it's not just the talent. To me, it's the coaching is so good here. And so I'll give a quick example. When we're at Charlotte, you know, we thought we were going to have a really, really good season, and we did. We had two spots open. We signed two local kids. And, you know, what we did want to do is sign kids that we had to spend time and, and teach them how to guard a double and a fade and a rear and getting over ball screen and, and being in, the, you know, the passing lanes. They were coached by two really, really good coaches. And so from day one, we were already on chapter three, right? Because they, they knew the rest. And so that's what's so appealing for us and for coach for this job was the fact that the coaching at this level from a scholastic and an AAU level, it's so good that we're not as a coaching staff having, you know, to start day one, chapter one, page one, right? when you get somebody else and you're, you know, four and you're three, you can skip ahead a little bit. And so, um, you know, for us, it, that's, that's always been really, really important. Um, you know, and again, to, to your point, we only have 13 scholarships and there's years you have two, there's years you have four, there's years you have one. And so, you know, and a lot of what you do with that scholarship is going to dictate a little bit. One, like I said before, who do you have a chance with? Um, and then two, you know, are we filling a need, right? Do we need a four man? Do we need a point guard um, or do we just need best available? And so there's a lot of different things that go into it. Um, I, I, I think that the basketball here is just off the charts. Um, and, and we talk about it all the time, you know, 
it's, it's not just keeping, you know, kids here. We got to make sure we're, we're keeping the right kids here uh, because, you know, if they're going to be homegrown talent, you know, for us, it's got to work, right? It's, it's, it's got to work. You know, Anthony Cowan, Melo Tremble, right? Daryl Morcel, Jalen Smith, you know, are guys that, you know, we made sure and we had a really good um, ideology that they're going to be very successful for us very quickly. Um, you never want to get a local kid and, and all of a sudden he's your fifth guard right away, right? You want to get that local kid um, and, and early on, hopefully, you know, start lineups or calling his name, you know. And, and again, in Maryland, that crowd, it's, 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 it's different when you're local now, right? I mean, oh, man, it's, it's fun. Um, and so it's, it's really important to us. Um, you know, we're, you know, that's, that's, you know, one of the things that we talk about daily from a recruiting perspective. Um, and, and again, I think it goes back to, you know, again, there's a lot of talent, but you know, why is there a lot of talent to me is because there's a lot of really good coaches here um, who spend the time with these kids um, and do it for the right reasons. Absolutely. So the, the guy that I typically see in, in gyms uh, in WCAC gyms and you know, some, some schools in the area uh, is Coach Brady. Um, talk about how, you know, each staff, you know, at pretty much every program splits up the country kind of by region. And, you know, it, it goes to that, you know, the coach that has a connection with that region typically. Uh, talk about, you know, what makes that, that part successful and then kind of what regions your specific assistants, you know, kind of thrive. Yeah, so, you know, I've, I've been a couple of different staffs that do it differently. You know, I've been at a staff where, hey, okay, you know, George is yours, South Carolina is yours. So listen, you've got this, you've got that. Um, you know, for us at Maryland right now, you know, for us, our job right now is, is to evaluate as many players as we can. Now, being in a pandemic right now, we're watching a ton of film. And we're not watching the highlight film. We're watching, you know, actual game film and seeing, you know, can he get back in defensive transition? What's his motor like? And what's his body language in the timeout? And you know, what's his foot speed when guarding the ball? You know, can he guard a ball screen? Different things like that. And so um, we don't necessarily say you've got X, you've got Y, and you've got Z. I think, you know, understanding that, you know, most assistant coaches, you're kind of your own CEO in a way, right? You're your own traveling salesman. And so – as you go out and, and, and you go recruit and you evaluate, you want to spend time in gyms if you feel like you have an opportunity, um, you know, to have a chance, right? There's that word again, have a chance. And so uh, we're not, we're not, we, we don't break up. You got X, you got Y, you can't go there, you can't go there. Because at the end of the day, we like to have a lot of eyes on a kid, right? And so if you bring a kid's name to the table um, and you give your opinion, right? There's times, hey, listen, you know, hey, Coach Bino, I, I love to get your eyes on this kid. You know, can you go to this game and, and, and tell me what you think? Um, or, hey, Coach Dre, you know, hey, what do you think? I got a kid in Ohio, you know, if you got nothing this week, I'd love for you to go see him. And because at the end of the day, you know, we're big on this as well. When you when a kid comes to campus and, he, and if he's got one point man as his assistant coach, right? So it's just, you know, X recruited him and the head coach. Well, if X gets a job, and leaves, well, who's fighting for that kid, right, for, for shots and playing time? And who's going to spend the extra time in the gym a little bit? And so if we're able to establish a relationship early with everybody on our staff, he can feel a lot more comfortable, right, that if X does leave, well, I'll tell you what, me and Coach so-and-so are really tight, and me and Coach so-and-so are really tight. And so that's something I think has been really important to us is having dynamic relationships, um, with multiple guys in our staff. And that's something we've really tried to do. Um, and I think it's been really, really successful for us. And, um, you know, it's something I've definitely learned that, you know, I get the opportunity to, I, I think it's really important. Absolutely. Talk about, you know, Coach Sturgeon came, I believe it was in 2011, and uh, he's taken over from the legend, Gary Williams. Um, talk about some of the pressures and, uh, I mean, some of the benefits of, of coming to a program right after a legend. Uh, kind of leaves, you know, because I'm sure that there, you know, there's some talent left behind for you guys as well. Yeah, I, you know, for me, I can only talk about what I know and what I've seen when I've been here. Um, and this, I'm going on my sixth year, and so, um, you know, for me at least, it, it, it's never easy to replace somebody like, you know, Gary Williams, a Hall of Famer. And, you know, you look at, you know, different places when, you know, Dean Smith um, left North Carolina, right? I mean, it was, it was probably more turnaround the first couple, you know, five, 10 years in North Carolina from a head coaching perspective than it was in 25, 30 years. And so um, it's not easy. 
Um, it is difficult, um, you know, especially from a fan base perspective because you're, you're so accustomed to one style of play. You're so accustomed to one personality. And then, you know, throwing the fact that you're now accustomed to ACC teams, right? You're accustomed to certain rivalries a little bit. Um, and, and those fans a lot of times are also coaches, right? Local high school coaches, AAU coaches, um, kids growing up, seeing things a different way. And so, um, you know, for do what Coach Turgeon has done, um, to switch leagues um, like he has. And, and, and I, th I think people at times um, disvalue how hard that is. Um, you know, we were at the Atlantic 10 at Charlotte with Coach Major, um, and we, we got a roster we felt like could compete at the Atlantic 10. What I mean by that is there are certain positions that we felt like you have to have this type of makeup to be successful in the Atlantic 10. Um, and then all of a sudden, before we knew it, we were in the Conference USA. And the four-man the Atlantic 10 is very different than the four-man the Conference USA. At the time, the four-man Atlantic 10, that's, that's a 6'9", back-to-the-basket guy. And the Conference USA, that's a 6'4", guard that can shoot. And so, you know, for us, it was a major recruiting, a major X and O adjustment for us when we switched leagues. Um, and so, you know, for Coach Turgeon to, to have the success he has, to average 12 wins every year in the Big Ten since he's been in the Big Ten, ah, that's tremendous to do that. And then on, to me, you add the fact that the expectations are so high because of the person you're replacing. Uh, I, I think at times, you know, what he's done, you know, it, it's been remarkable for me, for me to see it. And, and to have a hand in that, it, it's, it's meant the world to me. Absolutely. You know, the one thing that, that I don't typically hear, you know, in defense of, you know, the job that Coach Sturgeon has done is, uh, Coach Jones actually brought it up. He was talking about how, um, you know, guys like Alex Len, you know, guys like Kevin Herter, you know, you guys did such a great job at developing them that, you know, they left early and they got drafted high. And, you know, they're doing, you know, they're still in the NBA, you know, still doing the same thing. Um, kind of yeah. Talking, so. Yeah, you know, that's one thing we talk about as a staff all the time is how do we get old, right? How do we get experienced? <laughs> and, and it's hard because, um, you know, the kids that we want to recruit are pretty high-level basketball players. Um, and then we're going to spend so much sweat equity with these kids um, that we're going to do everything we can to develop th these players. You know, and, and I look at Coach Turgeon, you can't go from a Jacksonville State to a Maryland unless you know how to develop talent. Um, and that's what he's really, really special at. He takes our individual skill work to heart. He, he's the guy on the floor. I know I've been at staffs where, you know, Head coaches allow the assistant coaches the opportunity, um, you know, to kind of run with individuals. But to coach, it's an opportunity to, for him at least to earn some of that sweat equity keep with his players. And, you know, he was individual development instructor for the Philadelphia 76ers under Larry Brown. And so he's got the background for it. He, he still has the love and the passion for it. Um, and so for us, we're always talking about how do we get old. And so guys like Kevin Herter, you know, we felt like from an evaluation perspective, might have been three to four year guys, right? As of being a two year guy, um, and so that's happened. Um, you know, um, and and we just have to, you know, fill it by recruiting. But if you look at the Big Ten, and to me, why we were successful this year is because the point guard position we were old, and so since I've been in the Big Ten, from what I can remember, those teams that have won the Big Ten regular season. They've, they've had senior point guards, right? They've gotten old. And Andy Cowan is the first senior point guard since I've been here that we've had, right? And I don't know prior to Turge if he's had one, right, or if he had a guy three, four years as a senior point guard. But that, that means something. I mean, when we go at Michigan State and we're down six with three to go and Andy Cowan scores 14 straight points, I mean, that's experience. That's been there, done that, um, you know, and – in my first year, Indiana had Yogi Ferrell, right? Similar type of mentality. Um, you know, was a senior, won the league. P.J. Thompson of Purdue, senior, won the league. Um, and then Derek Walden of Michigan, senior, won the league. And you look at this year, Cassius Winston and, and, and Anthony Cowan. And so, you know, we talk about getting old all the time in recruiting. Um, but at the same time, you know, it's our job to make these kids um, as ready for the next level as possible and in the best position possible. And so we're not going to do anything to 
help our interest in that because for us it's all about them and so whatever we can do to make Kevin Herter better we're going to do it right whatever we can do to put Bruno Fernando in the best situation help Bruno Fernando's life on and off the court well that's what we're going to do um and, and you know if that means he's got to leave early then let's do it um because that's only going to open the door for the next guy absolutely Let's talk about that, that development and also the preparation for the draft. So, you know, what do you guys do, you know, for your, for your team after the season ends, you know, as far as giving them stats, giving them video, kind of showing them what needs to be improved on. And then also what does that draft process look like? You know, once, once the season's done, you know, obviously taking care of their grades and their classes, but you know, what type of you know, work do you guys put in and you know, what does that process look like? Yeah. So for us, once the season's over, we tend to give the guys, you know, two weeks off. And, and it's almost um, a reprieve from us a little bit. Um, and it gives us time as a coaching staff to really look at the autopsy of the season, right? To really kind of dive in what worked, what didn't work. And it allows us as coaches really dive into the film. And, you know, it's when you watch film out of season, you kind of get more organic um, thought process um, going a little bit because you don't have another game, you know, that you got to prepare for. You got a little bit more time to, to really take a look, step back and, and take emotion out of film watching a little bit. So you kind of get a really good feel of, okay, here's what we have coming back. What, what can we do offensively different? What, what do we want to keep offensive? What can we keep these guys, what do they got to work on? And so come back two weeks, we can really give them educated answers. Here's what we got to do for your game individually. Here's what kind of some of your weaknesses were. Here's your strengths. And, and here it is in film. And now let's attack this in the off season. Um, and then from a you know, development perspective, uh, you know, first Kyle Harper, our strength coach, you know, we pay for um, flying in the NBA combine guy. He comes in and he runs an absolute knuckle combine. Uh, it's the same exact guy that every year players have before. Um, they can ask questions, they can get tips, um, and they can practice as many times as they want that day. And then what we do is we keep that data throughout their entire career. And then we look at that data and we connect it with, you know, what other guys' position are, right? So you can look at a guy like Kevin Herter or Jake Lehman, and what was Kawhi Leonard's, you know, what was his vertical? Um and then gives us some objective goals for these guys to look at. Because, you know, doing really, really well on the NBA combine isn't necessarily going to get you drafted, but it's going to check a really important box. And if we can check that box to help these guys, well, that's what we're going to do. And so when these guys get to Chicago, everybody there looks familiar, right? They feel comfortable because they've done all the tests. Um, and then, you know, they, they understand little nuances that, you know, can help them achieve better numbers. So now they're walking in really with, with, with a lot of confidence. So that's the one thing you know, the coach does for you broke you broke up a little bit toward the end there. Say that one more time. Is this this coach has it prepared and confident um, if and when that combine does occur for them. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Um, let's talk about, you know, this past season, Anthony Cowan, you know, really, you know, had a, had a great year. Um, I believe it was after the Illinois game uh, when he hit a game winner from 30 something feet. Um, and like, you, you know, how important that was for your program to see, you know, especially the local kid kind of do it on a big stage and develop, you know, over four years. Uh, Coach Turgeon was, was talking about, you know, the, these kids, you know, a lot of people said you couldn't play here. A lot of people said I made a mistake recruiting you. Talk about how, you know, huge his, his development was for your team this year. Yeah, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know if I could say enough positive things about Anthony. You know, he, I tell you what, you, you talk about a warrior. I, in four years, I don't know if that kid ever missed a practice. Um, I don't think he ever laid to a film. He did things and it was you know, for me, Anthony Cowan, you know, he, he's somebody that's done it the right way for four straight years. You know, I don't know if he's ever missed a practice in four years. Um, talk about just kind of that warrior mentality. Um, and so, 
to watch his development has, has been phenomenal. Even just for me, from a coaching perspective, you know, trying to learn um, and, and study the game a little bit and just to see the jumps he made because, you know, his freshman year, you know, it was Mellow Tremble's team, right? It, it was, it was Mellow Tremble's team. And so um, he kind of deferred to Mellow early, which, you know, at times, you know, freshmen should do. You know, his sophomore year, if you look at what we did offensively and if you look at the plays we run and if you want to get, you know, technical on the analytical data of what we were doing, you could argue that the majority of our offense was geared to Kevin Herter, right? Um, and you look at, you know, his junior year, and if you want to do the same thing, you know, you could say it was for Bruno. And, you know, we're really a post-up driven team. And so, you know, kudos to Anthony Cowan being patient. You know, it was never about me, me, me. It was always about team. You know, he even said it, I, I want to come back and, and I, I want to hang a banner and to do just that um, and the way he did it because, you know, this for the first time was his team. You know, everything we did was, you know, revolved around him. And everything teams did against us revolved around guarding Anthony, right? And so, um, you know, all season it was that count and mouse game with Anthony. And, and, and his experience, his, his leadership, his personality this year, you know, became really our team. And it was so fun to really, almost from a fan perspective, get that opportunity to watch. Absolutely. He had a great career for sure. It's just a shame it got cut short by COVID, but it is what it is. So my last question to you, uh, during quarantine, uh, at least according to Instagram, you've become a grill master. Uh, what, what, else have, uh, what else have you picked up? Uh, you know, so I, I like most coaches, I, I haven't shaved. Um, and since, you know, our, our game against Michigan, not that I can grow a beard, but um, and, and not that my wife's very excited about it. Um, but uh, it is something I, I have been doing. Um, you know, and then for me, the one thing I, I've done differently um, during this time, just from a personal perspective, uh, I, I love – I have a lot of joy lifting weights. I love lifting with the guys. I, I love saying, hey, I can bench this. What can you bench? And, and doing what the guys do in the weight room. The one thing I've done differently is I started to run. And it's, I've never been somebody that, you know, went out and just ran a mile or ran this or ran that. And, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a little I'm, – I'm boasting a little bit. Uh, I'm, I'm a little excited. Uh, I started December 26th. I started running. Um, and, and six months on June 26th. Uh, I ran a mile under six minutes, um, nice. and I don't think I'll ever do it again, uh, <laughs> and, and I'm okay with that, but, um, you know, for me, again, just being a competitor, it, it, it was a really cool feeling, so that's something I've done, you know, I've got two little kids, you know, if I got the time during nap time that I'm not busy, uh, I try to go run a mile real quick, and um, just something different um, that this pandemic has allowed me to do a little bit. You lining up for sprints in the fall? Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going that far. I, I lied. One more question. So what, yep. what makes a DMV different than the rest of the country? You know, for me, again, I, I think, you know, I spent a lot of time in North Carolina um, and a lot of time in Georgia. And, and a lot of people say North Carolina, you know, the hoop state, so to speak. And, and, and you know, they're right for, for a lot of that. Um, but for me, what makes the DMV special is the people that are involved in the DMV truly care and have an understanding about basketball. Um, you know, the coaches here, and I, and I said it before, I, I don't want to get too long-winded. They know the game of basketball, right? They know situations. Um, you know, they can watch one of our games, know what we're trying to do, what we're not trying to do. Um, and they have time and time again have produced really, really good people, right? Not just good players, but really, really good people that are coachable um, and that want to learn and, and and to me, I think that's what separates the DMV a little bit. It's not just the fact that there's a lot of talent because basketball is so revered here. Um, yeah. I think it's because the people behind the scenes um, do a lot of really unseen things, um, invest a lot of time, and sometimes not for a lot of money, but for the individual development of those student athletes. And, and for me, I, I, I think that's what separates the DMV. It's just being – on the phone with coaches and, and having just meaningful conversations, whether it be an X-No conversation or, or something you saw on television. Uh, to me, it's the people in the DMV and their investment in the student athletes at the high school and middle school level 
for the long-term goals and not for the individual short-term profit. Appreciate your time, man. This is awesome. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate the time too. And, and, and anything I can do, you know, please let me know. All right. Thanks, Mark.